I took this talk quite literally, and I thought, you know, what are the ideas that actually change the world, and is that, does that make sense? Because the world changes every day anyway, right? So I kind of, I realized I had rephrased this talk item into what are the ideas that can save the world, because that's what I'm interested in, and that's what I've been thinking about, and that's what I've been trying to do. And of course, no one can really save the world, but so it's been this, number one item on my uh, thoughts. Is there one single idea, is there one single or a set, a suite of actions that we could undertake that could save the world, um, including our own species, right? And I found the answer. Well, I didn't, but I found a book that found the answer, and this is the book. It's called Zero Degrees of Empathy by Baron Cohen. And if there's one thing that you have to take away from this talk, it's to read this book. Because this book is the answer to all our problems. And it says, and it does, I mean, don't, don't, take me seriously here, because this is crazy. This, this guy is actually you know, making a long plea you know, to show us that empathy is our capacity to answer with an appropriate language and emotions and a set of actions to problems, whatever problems, whether it be international negotiations, whether it be interpersonal issues, marital issues, whatever you name it, Empathy is our answer, and it turns out that um, empathy is the most underutilized resource that we have, and that's completely free of charge, so we can all use it, right? And I'm going to talk about ocean conservation, but I thought I should start with empathy because I think the reason why the world is going to hell, basically, is because um, public policy processes, decision-making, you know, political processes seriously lack empathy, as we know. And so I'm going to start by telling you who I am, or actually, we don't care about that, but I'm going to start by telling you why I'm here. And I, I'm here because I started devoting a lot of my time and, and professional activity to trying to save the deep ocean. So I started discovering what the deep sea is about, and I don't know if you're very familiar with it, but at the time I started, um, in the years, late 1990s, early 2000s, um, not a lot of people had seen the BBC show, you know, Blue Planet, which talked about the deep sea, and I hadn't written my book yet about the deep sea. And I found out that the deep sea is a large environment full of really weird creatures, and actually it's home to the largest reservoir of species on Earth. Um, and so I don't know if you're familiar with these faces, but they look very strange. And so I found out about this, you know, uh, just spectacular amount of animals that I had never seen before. They live in an extreme environment. It's dark, it's cold, there's no food. Um, you know, it, uh, whatever there is to eat it actually falls from the surface. And there are things like sponges that live on the seafloor um, that can grow very big and they can live hundreds or thousands of years. There's more corals in the deep sea than there are uh, in the surface waters, so we all think you know, there's corals in Egypt and Australia and whatnot, but it turns out that the biggest amount of coral species live in the deep ocean, and an animal like this one is a coral that can live more than 4,500 years, and these are animals that have the record of the longest living things on this planet animals, that is, because there are trees that can live a bit older than that. And all of this, you know, hu unique and huge diversity is, is taken down and completely scraped off the surface by trawlers, huge, you know, fishing gear, which leaves nothing but traces like the ones that you can see here on this slide in their wake. So the fishing method that you may have heard of it's called deep sea bottom trawling, and that's what it consists of. It's just a ship that tows very heavy, large gear. And this is the, a real picture of somebody, you know, standing near one of you called these huge doors that are, keep the net open. And these are two tons each. So before you catch the first fish, and this occurs at up to 1,800 meters of depth, so really, really deep down, you've already, you know, you're already towing gears that's extremely heavy 
with rollers like that that go along so you can see the opening of the net. These rollers are all along the opening of the net. And that, that gear, which looks pretty much like a war machine, not at all fishing gear, is stowed all along the seafloor just to catch a few fish that really no one cares about. And this is what happens. This is a, a 3D image um, of something that you can never really see yourself because no one can go down and actually take a picture because, of course, deep down at those depths, there is no light, right? So you can't take a picture of anything beyond a few meters. So you can never have such a wide angle. But this is what we made and we commissioned at um, the nonprofit that I, I started so that people would actually have an, you know, an idea of what it's like. And it's exactly what it is. It's just deforestation. And if it happened in the jungle, in the savanna, anywhere we can relate to with animals that we relate to, we would not accept this, right? No one would. This is nonsense. Um, and, and we don't really accept it. People stand in the way of this and try to stand in the way of this. Because this is what happens uh, when we go down. So the fishing gear comes up with um, the nets filled with things that you don't want, you can't commercialize, so they have no value. So a coral like this one, which is probably thousands of years old, gets thrown overboard as if it was just trash, you know, because it's completely valueless. In these fisheries, that actually keep on board only the fish that they want, and they discard a hundred other species. So for three fish that they target, they'll throw away a hundred other species which are valueless. And among, so this, these are the fish heads sticking out of the nets, and among all these fish, there are endangered species. And that's happening here, right? This is Europe. This is happening um, to the north and west of Scotland, um, to the west of Ireland, um, all around the world otherwise. Um, and we're letting it happen, although scientists have called it the most destructive fishing gear in history. Um, in July 2012, because this makes so little sense, the European Commission thought it was a good idea um, to offer to ban deep sea bottom trawling as a fishing technique. They didn't say we should ban all fishing in the deep sea because they knew that this wouldn't fly with the fishing industry, although it's very little, it's very powerful. Um, so they offered to ban just a fishing gear and to stop the destruction, basically, it made a lot of sense to do that. It seems like uh, the lowest common denominator for fishing attitudes, which should be acceptable. The deep sea fish that we catch in Europe represent less than 1% or about 1% of the European fish catch. There are only 11 boats which really target those deep sea fish. Most of them are French, a few are Spanish. Um, and all of them are subsidized. Um, they're all chronically loss-making. They belong to the French retailer Intermarché for the most part. Um, and they don't make money, right? So why would you keep you know, operating them? Because that's, Intermarché has a strategy by which you know, they integrate um, vertical production schemes and they want fish to put in the supermarkets. So for them it makes sense. Uh, especially because they're subsidized with public money, so why not do it, right? Um, there's a hun more than 100, per 100 um, peer-reviewed publications, scientific publications, that point to the fact that this fishing gear makes absolutely no sense. It destroys everything that lives on the bottom. It's not selective. It's a real issue. And there are even economic studies showing that it's not making any kind of economic sense. Um, there's one single paper that's calculated that one single activity, because you may think 11 boats, how much of a damage can one, you know, one ship, one industrial ship uh, can do at the time, at any given moment. And it turns out that um, these um, deep sea bottom trawlers in Europe do more damage than any, but orders of magnitude more damage than any other human activity uh, on the sea floor. Um, as a result, more than 300 international renowned scientists have you know, signed a sort of petition to decision makers to ask them to ban deep sea bottom trawling, which made sense. More than 900, or actually not more, close to 900,000 people which are completely outraged by this fishing technique, have signed our petition online on the Bloom website to call, especially on the French government, to ban deep sea bottom trawling, because the French government is the most you know, responsible nation for the, for the failure of you know, getting this prohibition of the fishing gear through in Europe. Um, France, because it has Intermarché as a brand, has a very strong lobby, lobbying our diplomats, and France, as a result, is doing a lot of damage 
and uh, European policy processes trying to make sure that this ban doesn't go through. And France managed, basically. So at the European Parliament um, level, uh, there was a vote last December 2013 uh, where European uh, parliamentarians were asked to vote whether or not they wanted to ban deep sea bottom trawling, and the vote was rejected, so we lost the chance to have the parliament, the European parliament, have a very strong and ambitious position, like it should have, because they represent us, and us, we're not totally dumb, so we know what we want. We don't want that. No one wants that. You may ask anyone, no one's want. You know, no one wants deep sea bottom trawling based on public subsidies, you know, making a lot of damage, you know, having a sort of no future kind of attitude to what we're leaving behind for our kids. Um, and nonetheless, the French were really active at the parliament and the French socialist delegation voted against every other basically socialist in Europe and, and that's why we lost the vote. After the vote, there was a vote correction because a few MEPs, members of the European Parliament, got it wrong. Uh, but it was too late, because only the click, when you vote as a European uh, parliamentarian, when you click for your vote, that's what gets archived for history. But as a result, it turned out they, they, a few of them got it wrong. So it should have passed, but it didn't. And now this regulation which offers to ban deep sea bottom trawling and to regulate fisheries in the deep sea in a very ambitious and very precautionary way is stuck at council, at the Council of Fisheries minister, uh, Ministers, where um, the French minister and his entourage um, are doing what they've been doing for years in Europe, i.e. making sure that you know, industrial lobbies you know, get what they want out of this process, which is a complete shame, right? It's just a political scandal that no one knows about, right? And so this is where we are. Everything can still be overturned, because mind you, this regulation still hasn't been adopted, so there are, there are things that we could do as citizens, which I hope you will do after this talk. Um, but as a result of the French toxic diplomacy, trying to convince other member states, so we have um, 28 member states in Europe, and France has managed to convince a few of them, key countries like Poland, Spain, UK, for that matter, which should not be the on board with France, because this is where, you know, in UK waters, that's where most of the damage occurs. Um, and they've managed, to, they've managed to convince a few member states to support the French position within, um, within um, European processes. And so the French, um, in, uh, you know, of course, echoing what the industrial lobbies want, um, plus what I call corrupt politicians, because, of course, they're probably going to sue me if they see my talk online, you know, saying we're not corrupt, i.e., we don't take, you know, cash from the lobbies. I'm sure they don't take cash from the lobbies, but they still are, for me, totally morally corrupt, because they know what the public wants, they know what science says, they know what the future is about. They know that this makes no economic sense. They know that the fishing in, you know, industry, industrial lobbies have destroyed jobs over time. And so if they really were out there to, to protect our jobs, to protect the fishing communities, to protect the, you know, the oceans, the overall balance of the um, ocean resilience and its capacity to even endorse climate change, they would not be doing what they're doing, especially the French politicians. So I'm totally relaxed saying that they are morally corrupt. Um, and and, they, and this, this plus the, the very outrageous lack of empathy of all these, these um, the staff, this political staff that we encounter, especially in Brussels and in, in governments, as a result, we're ending up with, you know, you're going to love my talk, it's so depressing, but we're going to end up <laughs> with a cemetery. I mean, this is what we're doing. I know we're all sitting here, and the last thing that we have and we should cherish is humor and love, because really that's, you know, and, and wine, because that's what, you know, that's what makes us still happy people. But seriously, our trajectory as a species is just absolutely mind-blowing. And we are, you know, depleting species after species, including ourselves. We're putting ourselves in jeopardy, and that's what's happening with climate change. And, of course, um, those deep-sea fish, 
And that's what's funny in the process of France, and I have to point this out because this is COP21 climate talks coming up in Paris, right? And we've got France and like Ségolène Royal, our Minister of Ecology, going around the world and trying to make a name with climate change and the climate talks coming up in Paris. But the reality is um, France is sinking and is sort of waterboarding this regulation process in Europe, you know, where we could have the most effective single action to protect the deep ocean and to protect those deep sea fish, that if you left them there alive, they are able, just the fish that we, we target as French fishermen, we target those fish off the British Isles, so off the UK and Ireland. If you left those fish in the water, the deep sea fish only capture and sequestrate one million tons of carbon every year. That's worth 10 million pounds of carbon credit every year. Right, so just the economic math is out there for you, just, just don't fish them, right? And they are fishing them and they are supporting the lobbies that tell them, we don't want you to touch on our economic model. And our economic model is huge boats, which you know, have to burn a lot of fuel to go out there, you know, catch a few fish, unselective gear, we throw away what we don't want, and we, because we are so dependent on, on fuel subsidies, we know how to organize you know, our political little um, you know, entourage so that we have access to the cabinets of the ministries and so on. And they get the cash. They know how to get the cash, the public cash, out of the system, and they do. So they don't want to touch on that model. And um, so I had to point this out because of the COP21 talks coming up, because France is really doing this double game that I think should really be put out there. Um, but. If you want to, because this is a demonstration of how absurd a political system can be and how, how dramatically, I think, inhumane it is, because we talk to every single individual out there, whether it be the parliament, whether it be diplomats which represent nations in those talks at European level, and every single one of them will say this makes sense, it's rational economically, what you're presenting is a case, you know, this is all, we all see how this could make sense, but yet they don't make the right choices, yet they go out there and they don't defend what we want, right? And so at the end of the day, I'm just thinking, maybe there's a problem with who we select and who we elect, right? And who we choose, and those people up there lack empathy in such a way that they don't care about anything else than, of course, themselves, as we know, right? Those that rule Europe right now are really self-centered, and that's the definition of you know, a lack of empathy, is that you are Im imprisoned in your self-interest. And this just doesn't work. I mean, as, as of today, this will not work anymore. So we need to choose a personnel that reflects on our preoccupations, on our worries, and we need to make sure that those people carry out what we want out there as a program. And our program is, we want a future, that's all. We want to make sense. Where there is one problem on Earth, there's 10 solutions. Can we just think about actually implementing them? And so one thing that I wanted to, to, I wanted to leave you with, if you have a zillion ideas, you can write to me, or you can write to us at, at Bloom. Um, this is the email address that we have. But if you don't have many ideas, then I have one idea for you. You can write to your member state. And if you don't know where to find the contact, who to write to, no problems, write to us, and we'll provide you with all the details. But Europe needs to hear that citizens just want them to, to do the right thing. And there's still time. And seriously, the only thing that they will and they will have to take into consideration is citizens' will. But for the moment, we're quiet compared to what the uh, industrial lobbies are doing. So anyway, counting on you for you know, sending emails and spreading the word so that we can actually change our future. Thanks.